السلام علیکم خواتین و حضرات وسیم حسن ویلکم سی ٹو دا ورچوئل یونیورسٹی آف پاکستان اینڈ لیکچر نمبر ٹوینٹی سکس آف برانڈ مینجمنٹ ایم کے ٹی سکس ٹو فور دا ڈسکشن ایٹ ہینڈ از برانڈ پورٹ فولیوز ان دا پریویس لیکچر اگر واس ٹاکنگ اباؤٹ دا نمبر آف برانڈس دیٹ شوڈ گو اگر ان ٹو ون پورٹ فولیو دا اینسر اگر وی ایپ ناٹ یٹ گٹ گاٹن there are certain factors which are to be considered before we can really determine what should be the number of brands to the one portfolio or for that matters the number of brands in different portfolios uh, let me tell you at the, the beginning of uh, the lecture that uh, there are no hard and fast rules as to the how many brands they should form for the one portfolio it basically is a function of uh, the brand's strategic role that we've got to carry out an analysis of uh, the function that the brand uh, the plays very strategically uh, within the category. And uh, if you uh, bring that into a sharper focus, then uh, I would say uh, into the segment where it belongs. And uh, we all know that uh, the market segments can be classified as uh, you know, segmentation by uh, customer type, a segmentation by customers the expectations and uh, the segmentation by product we keep talking about segmentation by the pricing and uh, by demographics and by quality and all those factors uh, but uh, the the fact of the matter is that if we have a very clear understanding of uh, the product as uh, the segmentation uh, customers expectations as uh, the segmentation and the customer type as segmentation, then uh, all other factors fall very much in place. To further elaborate on this point, I would say that uh, the quality and pricing, the two basic determinant of uh, the, the buying criteria on part of the customer are a function of these factors because uh, it is the, the pricing which uh, you have decided by taking into account the kind of product you have introduced or managing the kind of uh, the customers that you have within the target market. Uh, you know that through your um, the brand-based customer model and um, customers' expectations, which again, with the help of that model, you know uh, what those are. And uh, if you are very mindful of all these factors, uh, there is no way that uh, you will go wrong while working out the pricing uh, the strategy and uh, the while working out the uh, quality the parameters. So in other words, quality and pricing automatically uh, fall in place and uh, they become a function of the segmentation uh, that I've just talked about. Not all the brands within uh, the one line extension or uh, within uh, the one area of brand extension can uh, satisfy uh, all the needs within different segments of the category or in different categories for that matter. Uh, we are going to take a look at uh, the positioning grid or the positioning map that uh, we discussed in uh, one of the previous lectures. And uh, with the help of that, you will um, have a very clear understanding of why the one brand cannot uh, satisfy different needs within uh, different segments of the market. And why is it that you have to have different brands in order to satisfy different needs or, in other words, in order to reach different customers? It basically is because of the fact that different offerings could have different positions and not one position can cater to all the needs within different segments. And therefore, we need to have different positions. When we have uh, the very uh, well-crafted uh, different um, uh, positioning strategies, um, those automatically correspond to the differentiation and hence segmentation, uh, which means that uh, we are trying to uh, fulfill needs in uh, various segments of the market. So depending on uh, the, the corporate objectives, the intensity of competition and the amount of resources, that uh, the company has to itself, uh, it makes the decision about the number of brands it is going to have uh, within one particular market. And uh, it also can be said uh, with um, uh, confidence that uh, deciding upon the number of brands to the one portfolio 
is a the multi-stage process uh, which leads us uh, to decide the very uh, analytically and um, in a graduating manner with about the uh, accurate number that we should have to the one portfolio. The reason I say uh, the multi-stage process is because uh, we are dealing with uh, segmentation and uh, we have a history in terms of uh, the brands that uh, we have been managing and also in terms of uh, the market that uh, we have been managing in relation to our company and uh, our brands. Now, we started in one particular segment and uh, we started responding to evolving needs and in doing so, we created new segments or we identified new segments, we defined their boundaries and uh, pushed their boundaries and then decided where we should be and where we should not be. Therefore, it is a process which is spanned over uh, quite a long period of time which really uh, makes us graduate from one situation to another and hence decide how many brands we should have. So in other words, it is not that um, somewhere along the line that we think to ourselves very whimsically that we should be having like you know, three brands here, uh, four there, and five there. It is not like that. A multi-stage process has a rationale to it and uh, it is based on uh, a certain strategic considerations which have been popping up all along this scene and uh, which you also envision for, for the future to come up and uh, you get ready to meet the challenges uh, that are presented to you and the company uh, through those needs. So we can um, again uh, conclude, uh, which we keep concluding, that um, all the marketing strategies and all the marketing decisions basically stem from two fundamental areas. Never forget that fact. And those fundamental areas are the areas of segmentation and differentiation. They are correlated. I mean, the one just cannot exist without the other. They're not mutually exclusive, meaning one does not exclude the other. They always go hand in hand. When you create a point of reference, you create that because you want to define a new segment. And when you enter a new segment or when you define the boundaries of a new segment, you're doing that because there are certain points of difference that you want to address. And those get translated into needs which you are out to fulfill. The segment variation uh, in terms of uh, the different needs uh, which uh, we have to uh, satisfy and for which uh, we say that we just cannot have one brand or even extensions of one brand lay the basis uh, for getting into different uh, brands and different portfolios. Uh, one brand uh, can be one portfolio and another brand could be another portfolio um, and uh, by the same um, uh, token, I would say that uh, the one portfolio can have uh, a lot many more brands because within that portfolio, uh, you may have extensions, meaning line extensions, uh, because there are certain needs which are to be fulfilled while staying very close to the basic uh, and the core value framework of the brand and therefore you feel the need to get into different segments or sub-segments. Um, so this basically is a function of so many different factors. Uh, or in other words, I would say this is uh, kind of a uh, hybrid uh, strategy uh, when it comes to dealing with uh, the brands. Uh, sometimes you, know, you have uh, just one brand with extensions. Sometimes you have just one brand with no extensions at all. And sometimes you, know, you have different portfolios of different brands. Uh, we're going to talk about those uh, in detail um, maybe toward the end of this lecture or maybe in the next one, um, depending on you know, how uh, the discussion on the present issue uh, proceeds. That is a very interesting and uh, educative uh, discussion uh, and learning that uh, we must be the very intent uh, to go for. Anyway, back to the number, 
I was talking about the, the variation uh, the within segments. Why those variations cause us to start thinking about different brand names to satisfy different needs? I will try to explain that with a graphical illustration, uh, which is uh, going to be uh, very interesting. As you can see from uh, this um, illustration, we have uh, the four major uh, segments of the market. And uh, these uh, the four major segments uh, are divided by uh, the two axes. The one is the, the price axis, the, and the other is the quality axis. Uh, the price uh, goes to the vertical, um, and the quality moves to the horizontally. Uh, pricing at the bottom is the, the lowest pricing, and at the top is the highest pricing. And same it holds true for quality, which is the lowest uh, toward the, the left end of the axis, and the highest toward the right end of the axis. Now, let us talk about uh, the lowest uh, the segment in terms of uh, uh, the pricing and quality. I'm talking about the pricing and quality because uh, these two determinants are the, the functions of uh, the types of customers and customers' expectations and the product or service that you offer to sell. Now, taking a look at uh, the bottommost, uh, the pink uh, quadrant, which is uh, a segment in itself, uh, red dots denote competition, and uh, the green one is uh, the your brand. You are operating uh, into the area of uh, hospitality, the meaning the you own a chain of hotels. And uh, the objective at hand is that uh, you want to diversify into different segments, and uh, you want to diversify from the topmost of the segment, which is the blue segment at the uh, right upper corner of the grid. Now, while operating there, it goes without saying that you are offering the very high quality and very high pricing. From there, you are wanting to move downwards. I think it goes without saying, if you move downwards with the same brand name and a very low price, and you also define your quality parameters in a very different way, meaning you offer a very different set of promises and carry a different contract for the customers, there's no way that you can do all that with the help of the same brand name that you have in the uppermost quadrant, which means the upscale uh, segment of the market. What is going to happen? What is going to happen is that the variation within the segments is going to be so large that the customers in the uh, red segment, which is the lowest, they may not object to the brand name that you are going to offer those customers, but customers in the uppermost segment are going to be upset because they will say that maybe the brand carries the same quality and they are just overcharging. Or they may start developing the kind of perception that uh, the brand actually offers the very low quality and uh, the set of promises which they are offering, there is definitely something fishy about it, and uh, they are going to deteriorate and hence start losing loyalty toward your brand. So this is uh, the one example of uh, the moving downwards. Uh, and uh, the while moving downwards, you have to insulate yourself uh, from the uh, dynamics of uh, the one segment uh, in relation to the dynamics uh, which the, the marketing practices in that segment offers. Meaning the dynamics of uh, the situation in the red segment are very different, whereas those are again very different when it comes to the topmost segment. Now, by the token uh, that I have just uh, explained to you, you also can take a very good look at uh, the remaining two segments where uh, we have competition, and also uh, we are trying to position ourselves uh, with uh, our presence. Now, again, the question is whether we're going to go there uh, with the help of uh, some kind of brand extension, or we are going to go there 
with uh, the new brand? The answer is um, not very difficult to imagine. I think that you should be going there with a different brand name. So in other words, if you are going to operate in four different segments of the market, you should ideally have the four different brand names so that those the four brand names can have their boundaries to look after. They do not really have an impact uh, across the boundary lines um, in negative terms uh, because uh, you have different sets of promises for all those different segments. So we can uh, conclude uh, from this um, discussion, or rather this uh, explanation, that the variance in terms of uh, segments uh, being too broad necessitate that we go for uh, the different brand names. And if the, the variance within segments is not uh, that broad, we may go for uh, some kind of line extension. But let me give you another example with the help of the same um, positioning map. If you take a look at uh, the uppermost uh, segment of the market in terms of quality and pricing, and which automatically gets translated uh, into customer type, the expectations, and the product, you will see that uh, we are trying to position ourselves at two different points uh, within uh, that segment, meaning we are trying to have uh, two different positionings. Now, the question is whether we should go for the same brand name uh, in the shape of uh, an extension, or we should go for a new brand name when it comes to dealing with uh, the product or the service that we offer at the bottom of uh, this upscale segment. You are looking at the segment very carefully, and you know that you already have one hotel which is right at the top. And it is right at the top of the market in terms of pricing. You're charging a premium price. I mean, that's the highest possible price which anyone within the market is uh, charging. And the quality which you're offering also happens to be the highest because it is at the rightmost end of the quality spectrum. The question that flashes into our minds. Are we going to have the same brand name for the one which is at the bottom of this upscale segment? I think the answer should be no, because you are going to do something with the price, meaning a lower price. I don't say a low price, but a lower price uh, within the context of uh, this particular segment. So this is something very contextual. You have to go by the dynamics of uh, this particular segment. The question is, if you charge the same price, let us talk in hypothetically. Of course, the customers who are walking into the hotel, which is uh, X1 and which is the topmost hotel, may be inclined to kind of downtrade to the hotel which you have introduced at the bottom of this very segment because they may perceive the quality differential not that much. But the price differential, whatever it is, it may create some kind of perception, a very strong perception in consumers' mind that that is where they should go because uh, the service that is offered is excellent the environment, the total disposition which the hotel carries is so good that uh, there is not much of a difference uh, between this one and the one you know, we uh, have been used to. So we better you know, walk into uh, the one which they have introduced now. Now if you uh, introduce that hotel with the same brand name, this is you know, what is going to happen, what I'm talking about meaning this is going to win over most of the customers who have been loyal to the uppermost hotel. If you give this hotel a different brand name, what essentially you're doing is you're playing a very strategic and a different ball game. What you're doing is trying to contain your competition around that green dot. These hotels 
of the within the competition are creating a problem for you in the uppermost one. Of course, you have competition there as well. But in order to make sure that uh, the upper part of the segment or the sub-segment, so to say, has to be insulated from the competitive onslaught which might stem from the bottom of the segment, meaning from the bottommost sub-segment of this particular segment, you are going right there in order to fight competition there. So what you're doing is you are uh, protecting uh, the boundaries of that uh, sub-segment sub by making yourself present there and uh, keeping uh, the competition to your uh, uppermost uh, sub-segment uh, insulated and uh, keeping the competition off limits, so to say. This is uh, what I meant by the variance in uh, the segmentation and uh, I can say that variance in segmentation corresponds to different positions. You have seen it uh, in a very convincing way uh, how different positions uh, dictate uh, different uh, brand names uh, because uh, you, with the help of a different position, are playing a very different strategic game within the same segment uh, of the category. So, a multiple uh, brand uh, the policy therefore corresponds to a segmented market uh, the where uh, the various expectations of customers uh, are not only different uh, the, but uh, the which also are viewed the, by customers as incompatible. I think it goes without saying that uh, the customers the with um, in the uh, boundaries of uh, the, the upscale um, segment uh, see the other segment which is the, the lowest uh, part of the market and uh, which may be characterized by a two-star uh, uh, hotels. Do not uh, look at the two segments uh, as being very compatible to each other. They look upon these two segments as uh, the very two different markets and uh, they wouldn't like uh, the to be categorized as uh, the part of the same market. So this is uh, the, what is meant by uh, consumer expectations with varying uh, for uh, the various segments and this is what is meant by segments and uh, not being compatible in the eyes of the customers. Uh, the obvious upshot, uh, the result of um, um, these uh, the strategies is that uh, you can safeguard the boundaries in terms of your sales. And not, not only you can uh, safeguard the boundaries, you can increase sales in uh, the different segments, which basically is the objective uh, that uh, you increase uh, the value uh, the other, either by introducing the same brand by way of extensions or by uh, introducing new brands and develop a portfolio or different portfolios uh, which offer um, added value and uh, hence uh, make positive contributions towards the overall financial position of the company. And that is what the whole game of uh, strategic management is all about. So we can say that uh, as a comparison and conclusion uh, that uh, while the brand extensions correspond to a strategy of uh, the market domination and competitive advantage while low cost, the multiple brand portfolio is a logical consequence of uh, the differentiation uh, and just cannot coexist with the concept of low costs because it entails, rather, you know, it compromises uh, economies of scale. Uh, it has to have uh, a higher level of technical expertise. Uh, if not a higher level, at least uh, a varied uh, levels of uh, the expertise uh, in terms of uh, technical know-how. And um, it is something uh, which uh, requires specific sales networks and uh, added advertising budgets. We know by now why and how brand extensions uh, try to uh, dominate the market via low costs. It is because of the low costs that uh, we like to get into extensions and we know that the chances of success there are higher as compared with entering uh, the market with uh, a new brand. A new brand is uh, much more costlier, it carries more risk, 
and it involves the more time and energy. And the more time and energy, uh, more risk, and uh, the higher costs, they are all a function of uh, what I told you, that you need to have uh, specific sales networks. But why I would explain that in detail later, uh, you need added budgets because you're dealing with different brands. You're not uh, dealing with uh, just one brand, uh, which has been around, and uh, just talking about the core of that brand is going to offer uh, a spin over, a spin over uh, for uh, all those that form uh, the part of the range. So the, the difference between um, the brand extensions and uh, multi-brand portfolios uh, are very clear by now. And uh, it is uh, all because of uh, the nature of uh, the differentiated the positions that uh, the company may like to occupy uh, within the overall category um, of uh, the various uh, markets that uh, they like to go for different brands. Now, I've been talking about low cost in relation to the brand extensions while I gave you the comparison uh, as part of the conclusion. But this does not mean that uh, managers who are handling the multi-brand portfolios do not care about costing at all. The high costs are uh, the concern of uh, uh, the managers, meaning the business managers, the world over. And this is the one factor uh, which never escapes their attention. Even while operating within uh, the huge portfolios, uh, the managers like to uh, the cut costs. And I can give you examples uh, from different industries, uh, from the car industry, for example, um, from uh, the ele ele electronics industry. What managers do that um, they like to differentiate uh, toward the end of the assembly line, meaning they like to get into some kind of fragmentation in terms of for the features, uh, maybe also in terms of benefits, but more so in terms of features and less so in terms of benefits uh, toward the end of the uh, process. Why do they do that? Because uh, they like to kill two birds with one stone. And they like to kill two birds um, in the following way. They cut costs because that's one of the objectives, that you have to produce very high quality by remaining within one costing framework. And the other birds which they kill with the same stone is that uh, they still maintain a lot of common features uh, within the basic product uh, by way of using the same assembly line and fragmenting only toward the end of the process. When they go for a lot of common features, they save costs. And they save costs by uh, way of uh, uh, reaping the benefits of the learning curve. The concept that uh, you must have learned in one of the courses, maybe operations management or some other one. So uh, it is the learning curve which really attracts or which really induces the managers to go for a lot of common features. The most important point to consider here for the managers is if they are handling different portfolios, meaning if they are producing different brands uh, which are supposed to satisfy different needs within different segments, then they are not to bring in the common features uh, to the point of undesirability, the meaning there has to be a level of uh, common features with which is a desirable level up to which none of the consu consumers or customers uh, is going to object. But if it is a case of uh, just uh, changing the, uh, the brand name and uh, just bringing about uh, a few you know, cosmetic changes here and there, then the customers definitely are going to uh, the stage revolt the by saying, well, this amounts to the proliferation, uh, which is not really necessary because uh, all the features are just about the same and uh, we do not really see any meaningful differentiation. So in other words, you as the business managers uh, have to maintain a balance between the factor of cost and the factor of maintaining the common features. That lays the foundation for um, different brands and that necessitates for the business managers to go into the area of brand portfolios. 
I think our understanding uh, the by way of examples and uh, by way of uh, the illustration of uh, the concept of segmentation and positioning uh, makes it uh, very clear uh, why is it that uh, we go into creating uh, the new brands um, after uh, we have started feeling the limitations of uh, the concept of brand extensions. Now let us uh, summarize all this uh, by way of uh, uh, the positive sides are by way of uh, the factors that really they actuate the business managers to get into uh, the multi-brand portfolios. As a summary, we can say uh, it is the collective uh, the play uh, which uh, really uh, makes it uh, very important for uh, the business uh, community as a whole uh, to go for uh, the different brands. It is not only on part of just one company, it is on part of all the companies within the market, meaning within one particular market, that they play their respective roles to build up the market. And like it is said, the one brand just can never satisfy all the needs, and therefore the one brand just cannot form the whole market. Now, in order for the market to be vibrant, in order for the market to be the very um, diverse, uh, you have to have uh, different players uh, within the category uh, who are playing their respective roles in relation to the positions they create, in relation to the needs, in other words, uh, which they are out to satisfy. So it is the collective and uh, in a huge combination uh, of uh, the satisfaction of needs on part of all the players that uh, the total market is formed. In other words, Everybody is out to communicate with the customers. When everybody is communicating with you know, his customers, we are all communicating with the total market. And it is the aggregate effect of that communication, of that awareness, uh, that uh, the people really get exposed to the, all the, uh, the brands and all the products that are available on the market. So the combined the advertising and communications on part of all the players uh, develop a combined view of uh, the total category. So in other words, it is the multiplication of uh, the different players with which uh, makes the market very vibrant and uh, their presence from that point of view becomes very important. From this, we can talk about another factor which is uh, uh, the factor of market coverage. When we have uh, so many different players uh, playing their uh, due roles within the category, they are of course going to cover the market in a better way. The whole market just cannot be covered by just one brand. Even if the brand has so, so many different extensions, I mean that's very important to keep in mind. The market coverage is achieved with the help of the multiplication of players. Because uh, the it is on part of those different players that they try to reach so many different markets. The you are strong in this particular market and so somebody else is strong in another market and so on and so forth. And this is how uh, you cover the markets. Uh, this of course doesn't mean that uh, you leave one market for the other and uh, the same happens with the other player uh, and uh, the same keeps happening down the line. No, but you compete each other in all the major markets but uh, there are certain markets where uh, not every player has the means to reach. So the overall coverage of the market in terms of geography and also in terms of the customer type, also in terms of the customer's expectations and also in terms of different differentiated products that is done with the help of so many different players. So that is what uh, the factor of uh, the market coverage is all about. Now let me add uh, something here that uh, the market coverage uh, can also be achieved uh, by uh, the one player to a very large extent. You might start questioning how come that is possible. Well if one player is a major player and is very resourceful, that player uh, might like to come into the same market with two or three different brands. And this precisely is the concept that I've been discussing so far. It is because of the, the multiplication of presence of different players. If one of the players takes on so many different roles, meaning if that player wears so many different hats, 
uh, in so many different situations, uh, the player is going to have the character of a multiple of a multiple player. But basically, it boils down to the factor of coverage, which is possible only if you have uh, there are so many different players who form that market. So, in other words, yet again, you can say that there are so many different price quality indexes. And not all the price quality indexes, meaning PQIs, can be satisfied by just one player. There's a limit to the ability and capability on part of just one player to do whatever you know, that player can do within one particular market. And like to say, there is only so much that you can do. Yet another factor which uh, really motivates managers to get into multiple brand policy and the multiple brand portfolios that it keeps competition away and uh, it gives competition a very effective fight. Let me take you back to the, the positioning map uh, in which you saw the positions which you would like to occupy as uh, the owner of a hotel chain uh, that is wanting to move into you know, so many different segments right from uh, the top mosque, the meaning five star uh, the hotel uh, the chain to the lowest possible one which is uh, like you know, the two star hotel chain. And um, when you are making an entry into the segments where you were not before and you're doing that with a different brand and while you're doing that you know that when you are doing that you are giving competition an effective fight and uh, the keeping competition off limits uh, in relation to your strong brands which are other brand names you keep competition involved in one particular area you define that boundary of the competitive fight and uh, keep competition busy there. And that is how you keep uh, the competition out also. If competition is uh, the contemplating to get into the uppermost segment of the market, which is the uh, five-star uh, the market, and you keep that competition very involved uh, at the lowest, at uh, the end of that particular segment, Maybe you are giving the competition so much hard fight that competition is out of resources to start implementing the strategy of uh, going into the, in the uppermost the five star uh, category or the sub segment because you are draining your competition uh, off the resources which the competition had the to themselves and now your competitors think uh, it is not really. Uh, very pragmatic to the move to move out of that uh, sub segment. They would like to consolidate their position there by fighting you there first before they move out. Another factor that goes into the favor of uh, the multi brand policy is that uh, it uh, protects the image of uh, your core brand or all those brands which are successful and which carry very good image. A new brand, if it is not successful, does not hurt the image of the existing brands. Conversely, if it was an extension and if it wasn't successful, it would have some negative implications for the brands which have been existing before the creation of this extension. So this is the way it really protects the image of the strong brands. And it therefore is an inducement for the business managers to start considering uh, with this factor with before they uh, make the decision whether to extend or to get into something new. Yet another factor is that uh, the multi the brand portfolio is uh, the very well welcomed by the retailers, meaning it uh, responds to the retailers in a very effective way. Why? Because uh, different retailers in different parts of the market cater to the needs of different customers. They carry different kinds of brands because uh, they invite together to their stores various customers from various demographic backgrounds. And as a matter of fact, the identity of the retailers is characterized by the kind of brands they carry. 
It is because of that factor precisely that you like to go to uh, one of those supermarkets which has the uh, highest level of image because you say, well, that retailer sells the topmost brands. And you do not like to go to a supermarket or a small retailer that does not really sell those brands, meaning those upscale brands. So the distinction between uh, the retailers is uh, obvious automatically that um, there are different levels of retailers and those levels cater to the different levels of needs of different levels of customers in terms of their demographic background. A retailer in um, a middle class area of one particular market is very different from a retailer um, in the, the upscale area of the same market. So it is because of that factor that all the retailers have got to be stocked with different kinds of brands. If you have just the one brand, um, even with extensions, that is not going to help retailers with stocking and all that. And the market is not going to be effectively covered. As a matter of fact, the character of retailers also supplements the, uh, the factor of uh, the market coverage that I talked about uh, earlier. And it also supplements the factor of uh, the multiplication of players within the category because uh, they all have implications uh, right down to the retail level. And uh, that is why it is said that uh, the brand management is not complete unless it uh, takes care of uh, all the stages, uh, right from uh, the vision uh, down to uh, the point that uh, your product or your brand is going to be sold. It has to uh, communicate, it has to uh, look after and take care of all the stages, of all the phases that fall between those two ends. Another factor which uh, makes it very essential for uh, the business managers to go into uh, the multi-brand portfolios is that uh, the multi-brand policy that takes over with extensions feel limited. As a matter of fact, the multi-brand policy emerges from the limitation of uh, the brand extensions. The one brand uh, with uh, extensions cannot, uh, just cannot uh, fulfill all the needs. If uh, the one brand uh, wants to fulfill all the needs, if all the segments within the category, then consumers are going to be confused. How uh, consumers of that matter, customers are going to be confused uh, can be explained uh, with the help of uh, an example uh, within the area of uh, electronics. Uh, just uh, look upon yourself as uh, a manufacturer of uh, electronics, uh, making uh, televisions, for example. Now, you have to uh, fulfill needs uh, within uh, different segments. Well, if you carve out for yourself uh, a path, which is uh, just one brand, one segment, you know, the policy and strategy, I mean, that's something else. But that is not what happens in the marketplace. Because if you confine to that, you're going to be attacked by your competitors and you're not going to feel insulated. The only feeling that makes you feel insulated is that you get into other segments also so that you fight everywhere and keep competition busy. When everyone keeps busy everyone else, this is how everyone feels kind of secure. So you are a manufacturer of uh, electronics, uh, making televisions, and you want to address needs uh, within uh, three different segments. Uh, one segment is uh, which just does not care about the pricing factor because this segment is uh, very highly uh, conscious of the technical innovations. No sooner than an innovation takes place, customers uh, within this segment like to go to the market and buy a new set of television. So that you're dealing with a very different segment altogether. The other segment is which is economy driven. Now this is the kind of segment that thinks to themselves that uh, we are um, uh, basically concerned about the, the features, uh, meaning the basic features, and uh, as long as uh, the television serves the purpose, uh, for the family, we don't care about the technical innovations because they keep taking place every second month. So does that mean that we're going to buy a new television set every second month? So we shall rather stick to the one that we have 
until this really wears out. So you are dealing with a different segment altogether. And your strategy here is going to be very, very different, meaning a different statement of positioning, flow out of which all the strategies relating product, brand name, communication, everything. Another segment with which you are dealing with is the one with which wants to have a very reliable and durable product. Now this again is a very different segment from the ones that you have been addressing before. I mean technical innovations oriented, uh, price oriented and now you are dealing with who are durability and reliability oriented. So you should be building a brand or you should be building a product in the first place that is very reliable and you are going to build in certain features which are going to address that particular need and then that is going to address that particular positioning and then you're going to have a compatible campaign which is going to offer a compatible kind of communication because you talk about that particular position and that position is the position of reliability and durability. So look at these three segments and once you have really understood the, uh, the essence of the three segments in their um, the different um, the shape and form, you are going to be convinced that you need to have three different brands. Now those three different brands are going to be produced by one manufacturer who is you and uh, you are going to take on the role of a manufacturer that is kind of a multiple player offering a uh, multi brand portfolio uh, to the category, to the overall category of televisions. So this is how a multi brand uh, the portfolio works. As a conclusion, we can say that uh, you have to relate different features and different benefits to different customers. And you do all that with the help of segmentation and differentiation. And this, once again, proves the fact and substantiates the statement which I keep making from time to time that all the marketing strategies flow out of two fundamental areas. Number one, segmentation. And number two, differentiation. Having said that, let us now also take a look at the constraints which the multi-brand portfolio may have because everything also has a negative side. First of all, while we get into a multi-brand portfolio, we've got to make sure that the brand that we're going to introduce does carry a very clear meaning. You will recall the factor of the cost savings. This factor never leaves attention of uh, business managers, whether they are dealing with extensions or they're dealing with multi-brand portfolios, they're always out to consider where they really can economize. While economizing, you must avoid the point of undesirability in terms of differentiation or in terms of the features which may not be too different from another brand which you are offering. So this is a constraint which has to be um, taken into with very serious consideration because customers otherwise are not going to accept uh, the new entry which is uh, going to go down the history of marketing as a failed brand because it was not very meaningful. Another constraint which uh, the multi-brand portfolios face is that of uh, the cost management. Costs always remain a prime objective of uh, all the businesses. All the businesses have to keep costs within uh, a certain range. And uh, while doing so, they get into so many similar features relating different products. And like I pointed out earlier, those similarities that they should not get to the point of undesirability. Meaning similarities that they must not expose themselves uh, to the point of undermining 
for the brand's capital. Having talked about uh, all the good points and uh, constraints relating to uh, the multi-brand uh, portfolios, we are now all set to uh, make the decision uh, what is it that we should be doing uh, because uh, we are now uh, at a stage uh, where we have to develop the strategic model the way we always do uh, at the end of uh, every concept or so to say at the end of every stage. So uh, going uh, just by the token of the model that we developed toward the end of uh, the brand extensions, uh, we have to look for the opportunities and growth areas. We have to analyze and assess the potential of each of those uh, offers. And uh, then we have to go for the brand strategy, which is a true reflection of just about the rightmost positioning that we want to create for the brand, uh, supported by the rationale, meaning the reason for being. And uh, then we get into a very pragmatic framework of uh, executions and tactics. With all this, the multi-brand portfolios stand concluded and uh, we now have a very good understanding of uh, what kind of brand uh, we should introduce. Line extension, brand extension, or we should develop a portfolio and what should be the numbers and all that. But coming to the numbers and all that, let me talk in the next lecture about uh, the strategies that we must have at work in order to decide uh, what is going to be just about the right portfolio. And after that, we stand absolutely concluded with the kind of brands that we should have. Thank you very much. I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.